Today we travel back to the old world. This week we will be exploring Tamarkan, the Magid Lord, chosen son of Nurgle, scourge of the old world, and now blight of the mortal realms. Much like the Glotkin, we know he was a chosen champion of Nurgle and survived from the passing of the Old World to Age of Sigmar. Unlike the Glotkin, however, his story does not fit into a 20 minute video. So this week we are pouring over the story of Tamar Khan, which is how I'm going to pronounce it this week. I know there's a few debates over that, but I've heard it different ways. We're going to focus on his rise to power, the terror of his army, and the stain that he left on the old world. All of the lore for this comes from the Forge World book, which is no longer in print, Tomarkon, The Throne of Chaos, which is a book many of you might not have heard of. Now, I was actually able to get my hands on a copy because one of my awesome, awesome patrons, and I did ask if I could use his name, so I'm gonna decline to do it right now, but he sent me a copy because he is deeply passionate about this army. And he has been supportive of this channel for a very long time, and I hope I can live up to what this book has to offer. Now, as I frequently point out in comments when people ask me to cover old world lore, I was not as familiar with that universe as I am with Age of Sigmar. So please do forgive me if some information is kind of abbreviated or passed over for the sake of brevity. This is a huge book. It's much like covering the Rumgate War series that I did a couple months ago. It's just a lot of information. Our story begins in the frozen waste north of the Empire. This is the Norska region. I'll bring up a map of the old world here. This is just the Empire area, not the entire world. But we're going to be referencing this map quite a bit because most of the locations in our story are in it. I'll leave a link in the description down below. Some volunteers got together and made a Google Maps version of the old world, at least the Empire section of it, and that's where this stuff takes place. The Norska lands are full of chaos tribesmen, clans devoted to the chaos gods, either divided, meaning they pursue a particular god, or undivided as chaos as a pantheon, but all of them are on their own personal path to glory. And it's here we have to say that chaos was something very different in the old world, at least it was expressed in a different way. Less of a another realm that you just can't really go to like it is in Age of Sigmar, it's a power in the air. Chaos is magic, magic is chaos, and just like the breeze it could pick up and become a tumultuous storm and unleash demons in hell on earth. Likewise, like wind, it could dissipate and take all the evil and all those demons straight back into the warp. This waxing and waning of power was an almost natural occurrence. But all of the tribes in the northern region were very attuned to the ebb and flow of chaos, and they could feel that something different was coming. Every tribesman and mystic could see the signs and portents. Beasts stirred from deep caves, births were marked by mutations that went rampant. Everyone felt it in their bones that something huge was coming. And what it was is that the chaos gods had arrived for a show. This power, this coalescence of chaos power drew all champions towards it. The epicenter of this power was a place called Zanbajin. It's an ancient location older than mankind, and it had long served as an arena for the games of the Dark Gods. Now these didn't happen super often, but it did instinctively call to all nearby champions for hundreds of miles. It was a proving ground. It was part gladiatorial games to determine a champion, and also just a part mosh pit where they just got to watch mortals just slaughter each other wholesale. If you were a champion here, you would be marked for greatness by the gods themselves and all other champions who are alive are forced to serve you. Because the fame you gain here on this proving ground spreads and you just kind of become a living snowball, right? Obviously, all the chaos forces want to join the biggest war band, have the biggest fights, the most epic deaths. You become the epicenter of that on Earth. And three armies met initially at Zambajin, and the first one was led by Haka the Osling, and he led a cornate war band seeped in gore and bloodshed. The second was Sargoth the Vain, and he rode ahead of his Slimnesh war band. And it points out that they were briefly distracted by some form of debauchery, but they got back on track ready for the fight. And the third was Orok Solbane and his witch cult, obviously representing Zeech. They were few in number, but extremely powerful when it came to dark magics. 
these three war bands converged and dove right into battle with one another, shooting spells and arrows and axes and swords and fangs and all kinds of stuff. They bring in all manner of beasts and steeds into these fights. And as the moon descended, the battle kind of changed a little bit. The battlefield itself started to morph. A strange cloud in miasmas began to take hold. And these really strange beasts started coming out of the trees. Bile trolls and worm men and all kinds of spawn and bloated mutants. They moved together like some kind of horrific parade. Like this is very organized but very strange. And at the head of this parade was a colossal toad dragon which is absolutely huge. And riding along him was Tamarkan the Maggot Lord. Now, pause here for a second. Understand that there are not just three armies at this point. Those are the three big ones. But there's also dozens and dozens of smaller warbands and tribes, because this is the absolute epicenter of mortal chaos forces in this moment. Because winning here is a path to glory. Rather than the lifetimes and lifetimes of bloodshed and all that stuff as you try to achieve demonhood, if you can prove yourself here... You can, like, incredibly speed up that process, gain the attention of the Chaos Gods, and hopefully their favor. My point is, there's tons of people here from various tribes, and they're all here for the exact same reasons. They want to please the gods, slay their enemies, and subjugate their competition. And Tamar Khan was no different in his motivation, but he was different in his power. Because imagine you're in this fight. It is absolute madness. And then... You look over to your right and you see a army of monsters and zombie things coming from the woods that are in stark contrast with their calm demeanor. And you just think to yourself, what? Okay, so unpause. Timercon joins the battle in mass. And pretty quickly, the Zinch warband bows out. They realize, oh, this is just not going to happen. They run away, cussing, realizing there's just no victory here. The smaller warbands are just dying in droves around Tamarkin's horde. Sargoth the Vane, leader of the Slanesh army, sees the balance is bad because they've already been fighting, their forces are diminished, and by they I mean the Slanesh and Corn forces are already diminished because they've already been fighting and then the Nurgle army shows up out of nowhere. So he's like, okay, the numbers are not on our side, we gotta do something. So he takes his honor guard of Chaos Knights and charges straight for Tamarkan. His thinking is, if I can kill him, maybe this ragtag army of beasts will shatter and kind of turn inward. Again, they're just a bunch of random monsters with some warriors thrown in. So he makes a desperate charge. And along the way, his kind of vanguard, his honor guard, is getting absolutely decimated. The toad dragon sees him coming and lets out this huge belch cloud of just like putrid power. And at that moment... Right before he gets sprayed by it, Sarath the Vein jumps from his horse up towards Tamar Khan. Now, side note here, that vomit stuff, when it hits the rest of the Honor Guard and Sargoth's own horse, it just liquefies them. Like, it's so putrid, it just, and acidic, it just breaks them down. And they turn to puddles, which is so disgusting, but so awesome. And Sargoth is midair, he lands on the back of the Toe Dragon, and is now face to face with our main character as his introduction, Tamar Khan the Maggot King. And what Sargoth sees is this fat and bloated carcass. It's like his skin is just barely hanging on to his form, Tamarkan. His expression and movements seem unnatural and horrific. And so Sargoth, not wasting a moment, drives his sword straight into Tamarkan's heart. To which the Maggot King simply laughs as the blow carves away most of his abdomen. Like, so when Sargoth is pulling the blade back out to, like, strike something again... It takes most of his abdomen with it. This guy is so rotten and bloated and decayed, he's just falling apart. Now, with his ribcage and innards all exposed, this is when Sargoth sees it. See, this bloated, grinning corpse is not Tamar Khan. As the abdomen flesh rips away, there's a child-sized maggot living in this body. That maggot is the Maggot King. He is Tamar Khan. And at being revealed in the open light, this maggot leaps out of the now falling carcass, lands in a gap in Sargoth's armor. It's the, the place, that little space right between his helmet and his breastplate. And it just burrows down. There's blood spurting everywhere because it's tearing into his neck and things like that. And it burrows down that chest plate into his ribcage. And there's 
this crushing sounds as ribs are snapped and organs are being eaten. This is terrible, horrific moment, and this lifeless body of Sargath crumples to the ground. And a few moments pass by, and it starts to twitch, and it stands back up. And the toad dragon stomps in exultation as he once again re- recognizes his master. And in this way, Timer Khan has stolen the perfectly crafted body of a Slanesh warlord. And from this, the absolute morale and back of the Slanesh force is broken. I couldn't fathom seeing your leader do this super heroic charge and he jumps over the putrid vomit or whatever like that that the toad dragon did, lands perfectly, strikes the perfect blow, and all of a sudden he is eaten from the inside out and becomes your enemy. So it just really wrecks the morale. The Slanesh force breaks and they all start to fall apart. Now, the Corn army, who has been fighting this whole time, is also seeing that things are not going well. And they decide to do a similar push. But theirs is pretty quickly snapped down because they, again, are still fighting several little tribes and then the sheer force and will of Timer Khan's horde is just too much to handle and so they are slaughtered to a man. It was there that standing upon this mountain of the dead that Timer Khan claimed victory. Now imagine there are still many tribes there but everyone is slowly realizing how futile this fight is. This guy is the winner. If you're a tribe of like 30 to 40 average Joes and you see this event happen, you're not going to go charging. And so with everyone kind of simultaneously realizing, okay, this is kind of over now, lightning flashes and a sickly green rain pours on the battlefield. And at that moment, he is the champion deemed so by the Dark Gods. He was Tamarkan, the Maggot Lord, chosen of chaos leader now of the Chaos Forces in the Northern Wastes and champion of Nurgle. And at that moment, everyone who was still there pledges their loyalty, even former enemies, almost as if their joining of his army was a rite of conquest. Now, after a moment of respite, the Horde begins to move. They headed eastward, and they sought out the Marauder tribes of a place called Dolgan. And news of this victory had already reached them. The overlord of the Dolgan was this treacherous and manipulative wizard who I know and love named Sail the Faithless. And he is a character who is constantly scheming and seeking ways to maintain and gain control. And so Sail has news of this victory of a champion and they're coming towards him. And so his number one thought is, how can I turn this to my advantage? Well, the horde reaches Dolgan and they send an emissary out, of course, to offer to join the horde and sale agrees because he sees that as a way of buying time he, he's not sure how to manipulate the situation to his advantage but he knows that he couldn't take this new power in a fight so his idea is okay i'll agree to help you now i'll give i'll bring all my troops i'll bring my best army we'll join your forces make the horde even larger and in the meantime i'm going to seek every possible way to infiltrate the leadership we're going to play a deeper game And so now we have the original horde, which is mostly made of chaos warriors and a bunch of monsters that all have been kind of corrupted somehow by Nurgle, like trolls and all that junk. But they also now have the non-Nurgle forces who are there at the trial, the, the gladiatorial pit who assigned themselves to his leadership. And now they went to another place, Dolgan, and gained an entire new marauder army complete with war mammoths and archers and marauders on horseback and the cavalry and all this stuff so his horde is growing exponentially larger and so sail seeing that they have this great military power now said okay obviously we're going to head south to conquer kislev which is the northernmost main fortification for the empire very well defended and if you can topple it that's a huge blow to the security of the empire but Tamarkan had a different plan. Instead, they went north, far into the chaos wastes, to a dark destination. A location called the Gallows Tree. It is a colossal tree whose branches were warped and twisted by chaos. It looks like a blight on reality, like a three-dimensional crack in real space. And none of this army dared go near it, but Tamarkan walked up to it with his new body, of course, walked into a open section of the tree. Now, a legend tells of this ancient troll hag that was gifted with prophecy living inside, and he was there nearly a month. And this was a long time for an army of this size, because these characters don't get along. 
Remember, a lot of these don't worship Nurgle, so they need to stay far away to avoid risking infection. And after several weeks, Tamarkan steps back out and they notice something very different about him because time moves very differently when chaos energies are affecting something. So it looks like his corpse, which again, up until this point was this brand new shiny Slanesh body, too, super fit and looking good, comes back out very rotted and bloated like he's been dead for a long, long time. So to Tom or Khan, it seems as though a lot of time has passed when only about a month or so has passed outside. And he leaves this prophetess, I guess you could call her troll hag, with some very powerful weapons, most of which is being scrolls that bound demons to his service if he needs them. But the most deadly thing he received was not actually a weapon, but a vision. And this is what he came here for. Why would you go to bring your entire massive colossal army up north just to visit someone? He needed the vision. He has the blessings of the chaos gods, and now he has this vision of great and terrible things. The world on fire and his army ascendant. He saw himself attain the greatest prize there is, known only as the throne of chaos. This is the domination of the world. To sit on a mountain of the dead and offer oneself wholly to the dark gods. To be elevated to arch demon prince. To be immortal and enjoy an eternity of slaughter plague and glory and that is the prize that Tamar Khan would seek and being filled with visions of glory did not make him unrealistic many had tried to conquer Kislev and been left wanting and he didn't intend to strike at the empire's most well-guarded point instead he had a plan we're gonna travel through the rough unforgiving country and we're gonna travel all the way southward around the empire not actually going into it and strike it from the south meaning we're going to go literally to the other side of the country and hit it from the opposite direction than what they're prepared for and this is envisioning this as like a knife piercing the soft underbelly of a prey in that same manner tamar khan's horde would destroy the empire the road would be long and arduous so it was best to get moving now, with every one of these chapters, I'm going to stop and kind of just do a takeaway. Where we are in the story right now, this chapter is about the rise to power. We don't know a ton about his personal past, Tamar Khan, but we know who or what is more importantly he is, and we know where he's headed. He's already collected a slew of powerful allies, these large marauder hordes, and Sail the Faithless, a powerful wizard, but also a deceitful manipulator. And I have to say, it was amazing to read the part where the maggot went into the Slanesh Lord's chest. It was super gruesome and I loved every second of it. It's the reason why Nurgle stuff is so fun to read. Now here's the thing, with the rest of these stories and the chapters that we're going to go through, you have to understand what kind of book this is. Forge World doesn't release a ton of books, but when they do, they are these massive tomes that are full. Every page is incredibly packed with art and content. And when the reason they do these big releases is to release model lines along with it. So with this book, the Throne of Chaos, Tamarcon, came out, we have all the stuff for the Tamarcon Horde, all the stuff for the Chaos Dwarves, which we'll talk about in another video series, as well as a whole bunch of monsters and bits and bobs for other armies like Grots and Black Orcs and all those kinds of things, just little additions to them. And all of those are going to play a part in this story. So while this tale may take us a little bit of time to travel through, and some of these events might seem strange while we're bumping into certain races at weird times, it's because it's in support of a model line. But this was a thrilling start because we know a few things about Tamarkan. He is bold, he's now blessed by the gods, which is super important, particularly Nurgle. We know his army now grows daily. We've seen it expand at least twice in this chapter alone. And he has a difficult plan, a lot of travel involved, it's going to be a hard trip, but it's a good one because to strike the Empire from the south would annihilate them. And few other Chaos Champions have sort of the foresight or kind of the planning and the ability to make that happen. And we're going to explore how that long arduous trip goes in tomorrow's video. If you know someone who is into Nurgle or particularly, of course, into the Tamarkan Horde army, Go ahead and share this video with them. It would mean so much to me if I got a like and subscribe. 
Again, I want to thank my patrons over on Patreon for all their support, particularly the gentleman who sent me this book. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow.